Great. Welcome to the third talk in our Human Discussions Collection, uh, where we chat with inspiring people all about humans, human brands, humans as consumers, and much more. I think you get the common theme right over here. So my name is Kate Nightingale, and I'm a consumer psychologist and founder of Human Experience Consultancy, working with retail, hospitality, and tech brands across brand strategy, customer experience, and innovation. And our mission is to create a better world by making brands more human. So today I'm super excited to be joined by Rebecca Saunders, uh, founder of Psychology, an amazing beauty and well-being retailer, completely with a difference. Rebecca has an extensive experience across lots of very well-known brands like Argus and John Lewis, and she certainly applied all of her amazing knowledge to psychology and then sprinkled a little bit magic on top. So um, Today she will share a lot about her story of how she started, why she started the business, but also show you how to really implement well-being and community into your business and your brand strategies because she's doing it amazingly well. So welcome Rebecca um, and could you please maybe start by telling us why did you even decide to start Psychology? Well, what prompted you? What was the, what was the journey like? Um, so, well, thank you, first of all, for having me, and it's, it's really great to be here. Um, so, as Kate mentioned, I'd, I'd been in retail for a long time. I'd worked in the US and the UK um, for some big brands, um, also for J. Crew and for Tiffany, and then for some um, smaller retailers or, or marketplaces like Not on the High Street, where I obviously spent a lot of time working with lots of small brands. And then more recently as a retail consultant where I'd worked again with some big partners um, like department stores and a lot of startups. Um, and one of my jobs at John Lewis was the beauty buyer. So um, I was working across all of the different beauty categories, working with all of the big brands, many of which are owned by the likes of Estee Lauder and L'Oreal. And um, really loved working in beauty. Um, but could see some of the limitations around the department store model. And as, and as a consumer, actually, um, when I talk to people about buying beauty in department stores, often people find that that can be quite an intimidating experience, uh, or it can be an experience where it's really hard to actually get the unbiased advice that people are looking for, because if you go into a department store and you want to ask, oh, what's the right moisturizer for my skin, actually, you could go around and ask five or six different people. And because they're all affiliated to different brands, you would get five or six different answers. Um, so it's not really a very consumer centric experience. And at the same time, when I was in that job, I was getting approached every, every day, often by independent brands that had something new to offer. Um, and often they were really catering to emerging consumer trends, whether that was things like vegan beauty or natural and organic or essential oils based. And I really felt some of those brands were very exciting, but the department store buying model with its you know, huge concession stands and big splashy logos and expensive fixtures really isn't set up to cater to those brands either. So that was sort of the, the initial thinking behind well, what can I do for these independent brands and how can I create an experience that's much more customer centric um, in this industry. And then when I went to Not on the High Street, I felt like there were a lot of these independent brands, um, but actually showcasing them in just an online environment also isn't necessarily what customers are looking for, because I think particularly when it comes to something like skincare, if as a customer you want to try something new, you do want to touch and feel the product. You want to smell it. You want to see how it feels on your skin. Um, and you probably want to talk to somebody about it as well before you make that plunge. So I felt there was a really interesting opportunity to do something that married all of those strands together in an inspirational physical space and enabled customers to test and try the products, to smell the products, um, and have a, a much more inspiring experience that was focused on the storytelling behind some of these independent brands. And at the same time, I, I decided to bring in some um, well-being categories as well. So rather than just beauty, which again, as I said, it can be quite intimidating, by bringing in things like um, yoga accessories, like candles, like stationery, we even had cashmere socks and pajamas, 
um, actually creating an environment that felt much more like a boutique um, and was much more welcoming to customers than some of the other options out there for them. So I launched Seekology in November 2019 um, with a beautiful shop in Richmond in Southwest London. And uh, we were open for four months. Um, it was a great experience. And through that time, I supported 70 independent brands coming through the space. So some brands would just come for a short period of time and others would, um, would come and if they were successful, then, then they would stay. Um, we held nine customer events. Um, so I really wanted to make sure that customers felt like they were getting something different and special. Um, so they were everything from doing yoga and meditation within the space to learning about how to set up a beauty brand um, or learning about sustainability or vegan products um, and connecting the founders of the brands with customers directly um, to really build those connections and make customers feel like they were getting something very different and special. Um, so that's the journey. That's, that's how it started. That's amazing. So you obviously kind of almost flipped like the whole department store model on its head um, and entirely focused on those smaller businesses. And you did tell us quite a lot of reasoning why you believe we should support them. But equally, you kind of created um, a concept that works for you as a business, but also very much works for those brands, not only in terms of um, actual sales, but also connecting with those customers. Um, so tell us why, why did you sort of decided to, for example, feature some of the brands only for a certain period of time? Why did you kind of decided to do those events, not only to kind of maybe create an experience, but what else was sort of strategically helping you to actually achieve? Yeah, so um, you've probably gathered that I'm really passionate about helping small brands. And so something that I felt that I could offer them was actually a lot more information and engagement and community than they would receive being part of a traditional retailer. So obviously that traditional model is the retailer buys the product, hopefully sells it, um, and the brand doesn't necessarily get that much back. Um, and I wanted to really engage with the brands that I work with and help them understand how consumers were responding to what they offered. Um, so Particularly if brands were brand founders were coming into the store, then I would you know, be able to give them some pointers about how customers were responding, whether that be to their packaging or their pricing or their overall proposition. Um, and actually, I think also the brand founders found it really helpful to engage with one another in that environment. So what I have seen um, since having the store is also a lot of collaboration between some of the brands. Um, that had participated and that's great because it means that um, you know they're really getting something else out of that relationship as well um, and in terms of joining the store for shorter or longer periods that's um, a business model which I think tends to work well for customers because it means that I can be very agile um, and provide the right kind of products that customers are interested in. So for example, in the run up to Christmas, it was obviously much more about gifting, gift sets, products like candles or bath and body. Whereas when we then went into January, um, I focused much more on things like essential oils, um, the well-being ranges um, and skincare as well. So from a customer perspective, I think that's that's really attractive to actually then see the most relevant products. Um, and from a brand perspective, it meant that they could come into this retail environment for a relatively short period of time and trial it and become part of the community um, without taking on a significant amount of risk themselves. So it felt like a win-win situation. And when it came to the events, um, as I said, it was a really fantastic way for the brands to connect directly with customers um, for customers to ask questions of the brands um, and for brands again to connect with one another and we also did things like meet the maker days so some of the brand founders would come in on a Saturday afternoon and be able to talk to customers directly um, and that's actually something that's had some real longevity in terms of results some of our, um, our best selling brands online are ones where I know customers met the brand founder in the store um, and particularly when it comes to things like um, skincare, that's then becomes a replenishment product. So 
the customer has met the brand founder in the store, they've engaged, they really understand the product, they bought it in the store, and then now they're coming back again and again every couple of months to buy that product from us online as well. Yeah, this is such an amazing strategy for actually building a much more holistic community. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I did actually include you in my um, article on multiple brand retailer community in the Journal of Brand Strategy um, coming out in November. Uh, but the reason why I did that is that it, you actually perfectly um, exemplified the model that I've built up, which contains the human relationships that need to kind of happen in those communities and that both uh, is between a sort of customer and um, you know um, and another customer a customer and an employee a customer and a founder of the brand it does also contain this um, you know this relationship um, amongst the brands as you said this collaborations that they've built up that knowledge that they had from each other also that kind of relationship of that brand with with yourself as opposed to you just kind of being a platform to sell you're actually there as an um, information advice um, you know encouragement and everything else but another sort of third ingredient which you've done amazing well is that aspect of reaching out to the local community as well and building a strong following and and loyalty within that local community so tell us a little bit more about that aspect of sort of localism um, in the community building because you've obviously covered all the other ones <laughs> amazingly <laughs> Yeah, I, I always wanted to build a retailer that had that local community element to it. And when I was thinking about locations for the store, I looked, you know, I looked far and wide and I, I did look at some locations in central London, but I felt that central London is, is very well catered for from a beauty perspective because you do have the department stores. There are a few boutiques there. Um, and I thought actually I could do something that was a little bit different um, for women of a certain demographic that maybe didn't shop in central London as much anymore. So they're not hanging out in Shoreditch on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I was looking for locations where actually there's maybe a slightly more mature demographic um, of people who really love shopping in their local centers. Um, and I settled on Richmond partly because I live nearby, so it's very handy, um, <laughs> but partly because um, it is an affluent area. And I felt like there was a great mix of boutiques that would draw the right kind of customer to the area as well. So I did also build some great relationships with some of the other retailers in the area too. Um, so in terms of that community piece, I felt like it would be much more productive in terms of my marketing and positioning to think about how to really engage with women in that local community rather than being in an area like um, a shopping mall or a central London location where it's much more of a transient shopping population where you would, in the normal world, have a lot more tourists, yeah. um, people who are maybe coming for the day but don't come back. So I thought it would be great to build something in an area where we could have repeat customers who would then, by word of mouth, tell their friends about, about the shop and hopefully send other people in as well. So that's, that's the strategy that I was pursuing. Um, and what we did find was that we got great word of mouth from our customers. So we had people who came in saying things like, oh, someone from my NCT group told me about your store and that I would love it. Um, but what we also managed to do was bring in some local brands. Um, and that was great because then we benefited from their network as well. Um, and the fantastic thing was that there are some amazing local brands in this area that I actually hadn't even heard of before. Um, so to be able to give them a platform within the store was fantastic because they could then send their contacts, their friends and family into the shop as well and build community that way too. Yeah, this is such an amazing thing. Like, you know, just simply by being in an area, I love the fact that you also build those relationships with those other retailers uh, and then threw out everything that you were doing and just covered all those other brands. It's, uh, it's such an amazing a testament to how literally embedded you became into that community. Now, do you believe that pandemic sort of changed the importance of community? And if it did, perhaps how did it change and how perhaps we need to, as brands, kind of change our strategies around it? It changed it in a couple of ways, which are quite polarized, actually. I think in one sense, everybody working from home um, means that you can build a community with people who aren't anywhere near you or aren't necessarily in the same country and you can 
learn from that. Um, and we do get visitors from the website to the website from all sorts of different countries. Um, but at the same time, I think it's actually enhanced the power of local communities. And just on a micro level, I've got to know lots more people that live on my street through our WhatsApp group um, than I than I ever had before. And I think people feel much more of a sense of responsibility towards their local communities um, than they maybe did beforehand. So that's things like looking out for their neighbours or um, in, our, in our street, when people are clearing things out, they sort of send a message to the group and say, oh, does anybody want these old toys? And so that's fostering a really lovely sense of community. And I think also people are certainly in a certain demographic starting to value where they spend their money and, and what impact that can have. And what's actually been really great to see is that some of the local businesses to me, like the butcher and the florist, have actually really flourished during this time. Mm. As customers are starting to think about where they're spending their money and want to support those local businesses. And so actually I'm really hopeful for the future that in some of these um, maybe slightly less urban locations, there will be a bit of a resurgence in local shopping people who maybe would have gone to london for the day um, are shopping more locally they're being more conscious about which brands they spend their money with and they're engaging with the stories behind some of these brands which is what psychology is all about um, from a national economic perspective obviously that's not without its challenges but i think um, when you look at it on a micro level i think people will be really keen to continue to support their local communities going forward. And that's something that I feel really positive about. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I've obviously, even before the pandemic, there was an amazing amount of research showing the rise of localization. Like even the, um, the business of fashion, state of fashion report um, showed quite a strong um, support for local businesses and even big brands like Nordstrom in US have been investing considerably into the, their Nordstrom local, their little mm -hmm. kind of, you know, versions of localized um, stores without actually any content, um, you know, any stock in them. Uh, but they did uh, see about two and a half times uh, increase in sales uh, from people that actually visited uh, those Nordstrom local stores. And I did see some um, research, I can't remember where was it, but that people are actually um, willing um, and they believe that they will continue buying, I think around 50% of people respondents said that they are, will continue buying in local communities. So it's definitely something that, you know, that almost got intensified by the pandemic. So you are already in such an amazing um, state um, as a brand. Now, you also obviously have built your brand uh, considerably around the aspect of well-being, which again has been a very strong, um, very well-going um, trend before. Uh, but it was more, most often by majority of the brands kind of just picked up and dropped off. Um, you know, occasionally, you know, let's do a little bit of campaign, let's introduce a new brand for a little bit, and but it's, it wasn't really kind of holistically followed. Whereas you, from the beginning, with every pore of your body, basically, as a psychology, you've done well-being across absolutely everything you communicate, everything you do, how you designed your space, how you, you know, created your events. And please tell us, how, how did you even do it? Like, what, how was it that, you know, that you not only stocked the brand that actually supported the well-being, but just somehow new to embed well-being into every aspect of your business and how can other brands do it? Yeah, you're right. It's, it's something that I always felt would differentiate us and that as a consumer, I would have always wanted to see. Um, and as I said earlier, I think there are beauty environments that are 100% beauty and don't necessarily promote that well-being angle. But to me, they're actually very much linked um, and it's been quite interesting seeing the press over the last few days about the importance of, of beauty towards women's well-being in particular. And I think um, you know, actually not being able to go for beauty treatments has had a significant impact on a number of people, which um, maybe other sections of society wouldn't recognize, but should have done. Um, 
And so I'd always felt like I wanted to combine the beauty and the well-being sides, as I said, to make it feel a bit more like a boutique, to make it feel a bit less intimidating, but also because some of these well-being products or angles have actually always been important to me personally as well. And so I felt like they would also be important to our customers. Um, and as I touched on earlier, you know, well-being can, can be a lot of different things. So we've stocked everything from uh, supplements to, um, to stationery that's all about goal setting or motivation. Um, but even with beauty products as well, I think there's a great opportunity to create a well-being ritual for yourself. And that's something that I've really enjoyed, particularly through the, the hard lockdown weeks, was actually taking that time, even if it was just five minutes a day, to spend on my own personal well-being through beauty. So, so well-being can mean a lot of different things to different people. And I wanted to make sure I was catering for that through the product ranges. And then also, as you said, through the events. So actually the majority of our events did have a well-being angle to them. Um, some of our most popular events were things like the meditation that we held in store. Um, and really when I was looking for a store space, I was looking for somewhere where I could use the space very flexibly. Um, so what I did for that kind of event was I pushed a lot of the fixtures towards the side. Um, so the products were still there and customers could shop them afterwards, but that was really secondary. It was about getting people into the space and having a wonderful time. Um, creating some time for their own well-being within that store space. So it was something that I'd really thought about as I was developing you know, how I could design the space and how I wanted to use it. Um, it wasn't ever just an afterthought. It was always something that was really important. And then I think the final piece to touch on is probably what well-being means for Seekology as an organization. So um, I've always been a huge champion of women in business and actually the majority of, um, of brands that we work with are female founder led, which is fantastic. Um, and my team is all female as well. Um, not specifically, but not, not by design, but that's just how it happened, how, how I found the right people or how they found me actually in many cases. Um, and I've always been, before COVID, I've always been a great proponent of flexible working and of um, working from home where that's appropriate. Um, and I think that to me is something that's been very important in building a sustainable business to be able to bring on people who um, have fantastic skills and qualities, um, but bring them on in a flexible way that a big company maybe wouldn't have done in the past. Um, and actually by doing that, getting fantastic people who really believe in the mission of psychology, but also supporting them to achieve the right kind of work-life balance and look after their own well-being as well. So that's just something that kind of runs through the business as well. Yeah, that's amazing. So a lot of brands kind of, I like to say, as we were discussing earlier, that a lot of them just talk the good talk, but they're not really actually doing things. And they might be doing a few bits and pieces for customers and some campaigns, but when you actually kind of go back inside of their businesses, that does not trickle through to their employees, which are their most important customers. So it's amazing. I didn't, I didn't know that actually majority of your business brands that you're stocking are female founded. It's, it's incredible. Um, I, I would love to kind of know a little bit more as well about them and kind of see some of more of their stories. It would be absolutely amazing because I know you shared some in your events, uh, but yeah, it just kind of would be uh, incredible to hear more. Now, um, on that note, uh, you obviously started with a store and very specifically kind of been very adamant to not open an e-commerce in instantly and to kind of really build that strong and loyal and engaged community. Uh, but obviously with the pandemic, you did not have any choice and you were super fast in actually opening an e-commerce website. So tell us a little bit about an experience and how have you achieved it to literally almost like that? <laughs> well, operations. I have to confess, it, it was already in the pipeline and I had, I had always thought that there would be an e-commerce angle to the business because again, thinking about a customer, customers don't necessarily think about channels, channel management in the way that we would as retailers. And so I always felt that the most successful retailers and to create a successful retailer, I did need to be multi-channel because actually there might be the customer that sees something on Instagram, 
goes into the psychology store to talk to somebody and then maybe transacts online. Um, and so having that seamless experience was something that I wanted to develop. Um, it transpired very quickly that it was going to be challenging to launch e-commerce at the same time as the store. And so certainly before Christmas last year, I focused on the store itself because I knew that would be the biggest opportunity to get my brands out there in front of people. Um, but the website was in development. And so it was actually more coincidental that it was almost as simple as switching off the store and switching on the website simultaneously. Um, but that wasn't really by design. It was uh, just the way things, things happened. And actually, I wish in hindsight, it would have been great to have the website up and running earlier because I think I would have benefited from that multi-channel halo effect. But what's really interesting that we're seeing now is that actually a lot of our website customers are still heavily weighted towards Richmond and the surrounding areas, which, which says to me that there is definitely something in this multi-channel piece that customers who knew the store or knew of the store are still very much the ones that are interested in shopping online. So I'm really excited about the time when I can go back into physical retail that I will then have a proper multi-channel offering for our customers. And I really believe that that is the future. Yeah. But then uh, also very recently, you decided to um, create those uh, in-person consultations, which mm -hmm. I was super excited to have yeah. one of them. And it was absolutely amazing and totally impartial. I know it sounds like an advertisement, but it was actually <laughs> totally impartial. Yes, um, your, your amazingly experienced um, colleague was, uh, was advising some of the brands that you stopped, but equally she was very adamant, listen, you love your moisturizer, keep it. You love your serum, keep it. It's gonna work. And, and I was so, I'm so happy with the things that she recommended uh, and, and some other bits and pieces that I have chosen. Uh, so what was the sort of, you know, I know that a lot of brands kind of decided to do those kind of, um, you know, consultations that previously was reserved for VIP um, type of customers. Um, but what was the thinking and how did you kind of see maybe changing some of your customer profiles or locations after that? Or it was mostly still focused on, on around Richmond? So my thinking originally was that something that was so important to us in the store was that impartial advice that I described earlier to actually, as a customer, be told what's right for you without any agenda, without any kind of commission on specific brands, but for somebody to actually say, you know, for you specifically, based on what you've told me about your, your skincare needs and what you've used before and, you know, how much you might want to spend, these are going to be the best products for you. And as you say, sometimes that means saying we don't have the right product for you or, you know, don't buy anything new, stick to what you're using. And actually building a business for the long term, it was really important for me that we can have those honest conversations with customers and say, we want to, we want you to trust us. So I'm not going to try and just flog you everything um, to make a quick sale. Actually, I would rather say, no, we, as you say, we're not going to sell you a moisturizer today because you're happy with what you've got. And that hopefully builds trust with our customers and hopefully keeps them coming back. Um, so that was what I was trying to do to achieve that genuinely impartial advice, um, that one-on-one -on -one conversation, because I think customers still, particularly when it comes to skincare, want to ask questions um, and don't want to necessarily show that they might not know much about skincare or ingredients. Actually, we're, we're here to help. And Amelia, who's running the sessions, as you say, she's very experienced. She's been in the industry for over 20 years. She's worked for lots of the very big brands. She's worked for Harrods. So she really knows her stuff. Um, but she will really genuinely listen to people and, and help explain things to them, which I think is what our customers have always valued, whether that's been in store or online. Um, so it seemed like a no-brainer really to set this up um, and we've had great feedback not just from you from from lots of customers um, and I think it's spreading by word of mouth so we definitely have customers that have been telling their friends about the great experience that they have and then we get other people signing up and again that comes back to community that was something that I always wanted um, but it's really it's a value-add service to our customers that we can provide that I think gives us the edge because where other brands can do an online consultation if you're selling just one brand or if you have a store team who's heavily 
incentivized to sell some brands rather than others, then that's not a great customer experience. And for us, it's all about really engaging with our customers um, and hopefully that they will trust us and keep coming back. That's amazing. Any final learnings for various kind of consumer brands and from your own journey? Um, I mean, it probably touches on se several things that I've said, but Seacology is here. I want to play a long game. I want to build this trust and I want to build an amazing portfolio of brands that have been handpicked by me and the team um, that customers will really engage with. And I want to build relationships with our customers so that they want to keep coming back. Um, so it's maybe a slightly different approach to what you might see from a traditional retailer or, or a department store. But I also, I'm starting to think about collaboration in quite a broad sense as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, as I said, things like collaborating with local communities, um, potentially collaborating with other retail partners to create some great experiences. So I hope really soon that I can actually share those with, with you and with some of our customers as well. Ooh, amazing, I'm excited. <laughs> so watch this space. That would be amazing. Perfect. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Rebecca? You can always find them on social media at Psychology. So uh, there's not a problem. And Rebecca is super open uh, in responding to any questions always, as well as her team. Uh, but if you have any questions right now, you're more than welcome to ask. Um, otherwise, I'll just leave you guys to be and have an amazing day. Um, before we go, uh, we have a next uh, talk uh, on the 1st of September, and it's actually with our amazing client, Robert Bridgman, he's the founder of Snack, uh, they're a sofa in a box company, super comfortable, I know they're my client, but when I sat on their sofa, I felt like a little child, uh, because it's just so bouncy and so comfortable. But anyway, he's absolutely amazing, super inspiring um, brand leader. Uh, I always love working with, um, with him and he always inspires also me in my business. And we will be talking about his journey of setting up a business, of growing, basically doubling the team throughout the pandemic as well, uh, of really kind of the challenges of not only creating an amazing product and business, but more importantly, a category that was not existent in the UK. So just a little bit of a snippet of what is coming up in the next couple of weeks. And we'll be posting the details uh, most likely tomorrow. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you again, Rebecca, for sharing your wisdom and experience. Uh, it was honestly an incredible to hear. Uh, now, Punam has a question, great. I love to hear about your well-being ritual that you've been doing during lockdown. Thank you. Yeah, so um, what I didn't mention was that I also had a baby just before lockdown. So it's been quite an intense time for me. I haven't had a lot of time for myself. So I've had to really kind of maximize those five minute opportunities. Thank you for the congratulations. And um, so I had to try and maximize those opportunities um, to relax and get some time to myself when I could. So um, in terms of what I would do to have that kind of well-being ritual, um, firstly, get in a room on my own with the door closed. Make sure that somebody else is responsible for the children. <laughs> um, definitely a candle. So I think a candle really helps to set the mood. Um, a scented candle and something like a prop, one that, one that I have here. This is um, one of my favorite candles by Ardre. And it's actually a wild mint candle, so it smells like mint. Um, haven't burned that one yet, that's a new one. Um, but that's, I think, something like one of those candles um, is great value for money. If you burn it for five or ten minutes a day, it will last for a whole year. Um, so it's a really great investment in something that can make you happy every single day. Um, I would then do something like a mini facial. So you know, cleansing my face and then um, using facial oils, which um, have been a real revelation to me as, as I've got a little bit older, um, to of help rejuvenate and refresh my skin. Um, and then one of my other favorite products, which sadly I don't have here at the moment, is a little facial massage tool. Um, if you want to have a look at it, I think if you search facial tool on the website, then you'll find it. Um, and it's great for just doing a little bit of self-massage 
um, a kind of across your face, around your neck, um, around your eye socket to kind of ease the tension. And you can do it for one minute or you can do it for five minutes or you can do it for 20 minutes, depending on how much time you've got. Um, and then I would say to kind of top that off, if you've really only got a few minutes, something like essential oils um, are really great to help you relax. So either something like a rollable, which you can use on your pulse points, um, or um, other kind of essential oil based products. Um, so here's another one. This is called the Breathe Balm, which is really lovely if you're feeling a bit coldy, um, completely natural. So just those kinds of things. I think, you know, just a little thing that you can use every single day. And I think the ritual is key to it. If you can do something for yourself, even if it's just five minutes a day, then actually that makes a big difference. This is amazing. I have actually also introduced the, the roller thingy uh, following the consultation with Amelia. She was, um, you know, um, she was incredible in, uh, in that and it does really help. And it reminds me of this amazing, um, I know this lady back from Poland that does this amazing sort of facial massage, like super painful sometimes, but <laughs> literally straighten my nose with a massage. So uh, it's maybe it's not as good as she is, but it does definitely share and I, um, does definitely work. And I can see that uh, people are also um, using that uh, throughout the lockdown and they have been seeing uh, amazing results. Um, so we have one more question. So what do you think are the next trends in well-being? start to see more of this um the blend between beauty and well-being and what that really means um looking at everything from sleep to nutrition so a more holistic sense about what well-being can mean and we're, we're starting to see some of that coming through in the products that um that we're selling so things like products that promote sleep um whether again that's essential oils um things like weighted blankets um so elements of actually supporting people you, you using these products to have a better everyday life and then on the beauty side i think and the nutrition side i think we're seeing some really interesting supplements come through that um can help you get good skin from the inside out so it's not necessarily enough just to put on a, a wonderful cream or use wonderful beauty products but actually if you really want that kind of glowing skin and really healthy skin, then actually it's important to think about what you're eating and where you need supplements to support that as well. Yeah, this is amazing. I've actually noticed that that aspect of holistic approach uh, is um, starting to kind of trickle through absolutely everywhere. So it's not only kind of us as, you know, as individuals looking holistically at our well-being or at our health and you know and understanding every avenue of that but it's also in a business um and you know majority kind of of uh, of the brands are starting to slowly understand a little bit more that you know we need to look holistically at the human being not you know not just their role as a customer and not just the moment that they're spending on a website it's precisely what you said is that kind of you know not just multi-channel but the really kind of holistic understanding of how that person kind of moves across that and you know and it's a little bit challenging sometimes to do that uh, but it's absolutely necessary right now so yeah so it's amazing um are we do we have any last questions uh otherwise we'll all just let rebecca go and enjoy the rest of her day i guess not perfect thank you so much rebecca again it was absolutely a pleasure having you and sharing all of your wisdom and experience. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, and please spread the word about the next one. And hopefully see you there. Thanks everyone and have an amazing day. Thanks a lot, take care. Thank you Kate.